Early cancer diagnosis is part of the PCN DES with requirements in the network contract and IAF points available. The indicators are now active. That's right in how they're running now. Uh, so do you and your GP practices have a plan to meet the requirements? Let's go deeper into this topic on today's episode of EGP Learning. Hello and welcome. So there is concern in the NHS and government um, and the general population that the rates of cancer screening, detection and treatment have been significantly disrupted by the pandemic. So it's now understandable as we're in recovery mode uh, that this is a priority. As such, early cancer diagnosis features in a number of the primary care network documents uh, and a number of the requirements that we're required to meet as well. Um, it's in the main PCN network DES contract. Um, there are IIF points available uh, in the CAN01 indicator, 22 points available, that's about 4,400 uh, if you take a point to be worth 200 points, which it may be for the absolutely average uh, primary care network, but uh, there's lots of reasons why it may be a little bit lower than that. And there's also a um, early cancer diagnosis support pack for primary care uh, networks, which is um, actually really quite helpful. So today we'll take a look at all of these documents and probably spend most time with the uh, early cancer diagnosis support pack. Um, we'll look at it in detail um, and some of the linked resources that are in there as well. Um, as ever, we are not NHS England, we are not your local commissioners, so do interpret things uh, yourself and work together with your local commissioners to make sure that you're delivering what is expected in your area. Uh, but this video will hopefully make a good introduction to the materials for primary care network leadership, managers, practices or perhaps even primary care network uh, cancer leads where those exist. And I think they would be a good uh, resource to get in place if that's possible for your PCN uh, out there in your area. Uh, the idea of this video is to get you over that hurdle of beginning to engage with the documents. Uh, so do download and go deeper into them yourselves as you implement your plans. So um, let's dive into the documents. Uh, so, uh, so here we are on page, ooh, I think about 58 of the uh, main primary care network DES uh, contract. So some of these requirements are baked into the actual contract itself. So it's important that we are uh, hitting these contracts. Uh, let me just readjust my screen and make things a little bit bigger so I can see what's going on a bit better. Yeah, so as with um, a lot of these sections, uh, there's actually quite a lot to do. So you may want to have conversations in your primary care network about what resources you're going to apply to early cancer diagnosis. And it's probably a good um, tidy and important section to um, assign um, a lead clinician to um, if you're able to allocate resources to that, perhaps from the leadership and management funding that's now available additionally to primary care uh, networks. Uh, it's also a, a good a way to um, uh, pull in um, other clinicians uh, from other practices and perhaps work together as a working group to meet these objectives. Uh, people are uh, normally, uh, normally quite interested in, uh, in cancer diagnosis. It's a really big and important um, area and some of the more clinically and less kind of organisational development minded GPs um, or other staff can probably really get their, their head in there, their hands around this topic. Um, so what's expected? So really it's broken down into uh, five uh, points and this is important because the toolkit is also structured in this way as well so um, so the first thing that people are required to do is to uh, review uh, do some sort of review of uh, suspected cancer and the referral practice across uh, primary care networks um, with a bit of an emphasis actually on um, where rates of referrals or uptake are low and an emphasis on potentially doing something to address this and this will lend itself really well to an audit uh, point B uh, requires that we work with system partners and it names a few like NHS England um, or uh, the Cancer Alliance or Public Health England um, and contribute and work together on local um, efforts to improve screening uptake and it names two areas in particular and that's cervical screening and bowel screening uh, and does suggest that we do something to follow up non-attenders um, and that we perhaps do one specific action to help engagement with a group where there's low participation. Next item C, it suggests that we work uh, with uh, with our practices uh, to um, to improve the use of two um, diagnostic tools. So the uh, FIT test, uh, which is a tool to um, help support and risk stratify uh, referrals in with suspected colorectal cancer. And just highlighting, this is one of those that's also an IIF indicator. So this is where there is a little bit of additional funding from the Impact Investment uh, Fund scheme uh, to support the use of fit tests and it also mentions the use of 
teledermatology uh, where appropriate to support skin cancer referrals. So this is where some referrals can be um, accompanied by a digital image of uh, the lesion that is suspected of being a cancer and that this can help um, the dermatology people sort of provide uh, some advice and guidance or uh, stratify risk around referrals. Point D uh, is shining a particular light and focus on prostate cancer and uh, suggesting that we work uh, to uh, with local data to produce a plan to increase uh, uptake of assessments for potential uh, cancer and uh, potentially uh, identify people where PSA or other testing might be appropriate. And again, it's um, suggesting focusing on uh, specific populations where uptake might be an issue. And then finally, um, there's a, uh, a requirement to review the use of non-specific uh, symptoms pathways. So these uh, in some areas might be called cancer of unknown origin type pathways. That's what we call it here in Nottingham. Um, and, and these are pathways where uh, the uh, a clinician and potentially the patient suspect that there may be a cancer and there are generalized systemic signs but there aren't any specific symptoms that localize to any specific cancer referral pathway to a specific department like colorectal cancer or dermatology as we've already mentioned um, and you know previously it, it was difficult to um, to uh, decide where to send these patients to areas have been encouraged to have these non-specific um, pathways to uh, ensure that these people can be referred and seen promptly so those are the details that are in the uh, main uh, DES. Uh, let's move over to the other document. So if we go to um, IIF, just to see what's in there around cancer. So, um, so actually it's, a, it's only a small part of the IIF funding. I, I think we've got potentially 200 to 220,000 pounds available to uh, the average uh, network for Impact Investment Fund and the CAN01 indicator uh, represents 22 points so that's up to 4,400 um, and this one is just specifically around the use of um, uh, increasing the uh, utilization appropriate utilization of the uh, the fit test fico immunochemical testing uh, which is used to risk stratify referrals in with suspected colorectal cancer suspected lower gi cancer so this is uh, it representing the summary i'm just going to really Buzz down the, uh, the requirements just so that we can have a little look at the denominators, numerators, and thresholds for this requirement. And I've put some notes at the relevant bit. So we'll get to that as we scroll down. What is a, a large document? And I know Gandhi has gone through the IAF document in another video, which I'd encourage people to uh, look at and engage with. Um, so here we go. So all the way down. So CAN01. Uh, let's take a closer look here. So um, just to highlight that the reporting period is already active. So um, so we are being judged on performance now. So it's important to get on and do something about this now so that we can make sure that our achievement is in the right place. Um, this obviously looks at the proportion of lower GI cancer two-week weight referrals that have had a fit test one week before or two weeks after referral. So that's the, um, the element of care that we're aiming to improve um, and uh, so the, the denominator is, uh, so the number on the bottom is the number of lower GI cancer referrals. And the number on the top is those that uh, meet this requirement for having the fit test one week before or two weeks um, after. And the thresholds are, we're aiming to, uh, we start getting paid, start getting um, funding back at 40% and uh, funding caps out at 80%. Um, and uh, this document provides uh, some detailed formula for working out you know where the funding lands if you're somewhere in the middle of that uh, range so that's where we are with the IAF so um, just um, some thoughts really uh, on implementation before we go in and start looking uh, at the toolkit in particular um, so implementation I think really lends itself to um, an audit cycle approach this would work well uh, to ensure you're taking all the boxes in a meaningful way. Uh, there's lots of other ways uh, to go about doing this, and some PCNs will go further than others. Uh, but um, structuring activity around two meetings in the year, one at the beginning, one towards uh, the end, with some implementation activity in between the two, uh, sounds like a sensible uh, mechanism. Uh, you might want to structure these individual meetings around um, those points within the main PCN DES, those A to E requirements, and we'll cover them again um, 
uh, in a bit more detail in the guidance document, so in a few more moments. Um, before you start, it may be a good idea to um, just take stock of the human and non-human resources that are available to help you uh, meet this not inconsiderable task. You uh, will probably want to identify uh, leads, whether they are specific paid cancer leads or other members of uh, practice staff, perhaps a lead practice or ARS staff, uh, even or care coordinators who can help deliver this work. And there's non-human resources as well. So those are the other partners that you're going to be working with in order to deli deliver. Um, these elements of the DES and uh, those um, uh, other resources such as uh, information, uh, data sources are going to be really, really important in delivering this this um, enhanced service. So just brainstorm what you need and, um, and then get started. Um, before the first meeting, obviously, those people leading the work will want to uh, prepare the agenda and the data for the first meeting so that those people present have something to engage with. Perhaps they'll be provided with it before to reflect on. Uh, perhaps part of collecting that data might be asking practices to um, run some audits or searches or um, collect some of the data themselves as well. But you need to make sure that everybody arrives at that meeting able to do meaningful work. Uh, at that initial meeting, you're probably going to be looking at the data um, do ensure that all the relevant stakeholders are invited, uh, such as your local commissioners, uh, Cancer Alliance feature really highly uh, and are a required partner for one of the indicators. So make sure that they are along uh, so that everybody can collaborate as instructed by the DES. Um, at the end of the meeting, having reflected on all the information, uh, then agreeing action points to each of the A to E um, points and requirements within the DES will be really, really uh, helpful to make sure that you can meet them. Um, and then in the period between meetings, you're going to be wanting to implement these action points. And actually the leads in the primary care network might want to check in, nudge, remind, provide feedback on uh, performance in between the two to make sure that people are working genuinely towards uh, these uh, requirements. And then prior to the next meeting, there'll be some data collection, uh, some re-audit, similar format to the preparation for the initial meeting. Um, and then in that meeting, uh, you will reflect on um, the uh, hopefully improvements, but any changes in the data, the effectiveness of the um, uh, action points that were implemented um, and uh, and then um, obviously set some uh, further improvement targets going forwards to make this a continuous program of improvement. And those are some words that are actually specifically in the DES. So I think setting further objectives demonstrates that that process continues beyond the single year. So um, for the reflection, so as, as we've seen, there is a lot to do. Um, the IAF will deliver maybe a maximum of 4,400 for this work, specifically that work around the fit testing. Um, practices, I suppose, are getting that £1.60 network participation payment, and there's ARS resources available too to help with this work. Um, NHS England are really asking for quite a lot of improvement uh, work here, and resourcing is tight. So being smart about what you choose to do, how you choose to do it, uh, and using all the resources available, particularly ARS staff, such as your SPLWs, uh, care coordinators, if you have them, or wish to appoint specific ones for cancer care, uh, and maybe your clinical uh, pharmacists for uh, more of the uh, medical or health related tasks, or perhaps even providing leadership for some of those other uh, staff groups will really help. I think clinical pharmacists might be really, really useful for um, clinical audit tasks, for example, if the resources aren't available or forthcoming from within practices. So now let's look at the uh, the tool. So um, so this is the specific um, early cancer diagnosis support document. I think it's about fifteen pages long, so it's not terribly long. Um, and um, I say it's it's written to support uh, the specific requirements that are in the PCN DES and IAF documents. Um, so let's scroll through and have a look. So, um, yeah, so just highlighting that this information is advisory. It's saying refer back to the main DES for the actual requirements. There are things suggested here that made um, suggestions and ideas and signposts to some really, really helpful uh, resources to help you and your team implement this. So it is structured um, with uh, five service requirement areas, one to five, which are the same as the A to E uh, network contract requirements. Um, so that's uh, this is really helpful, actually, and uh, sets it up uh, as a really helpful document to easily use uh, in your meetings, I think, and reflect on before and after. <clears throat> so uh, requirement one um, is uh, to review uh, 
the practice uh, across your practices and across the area for suspected uh, cancer referrals. Um, and it's just some, uh, so this really lends itself to an audit. And I think really that is what be is being asked for um, here. Um, it suggests uh, some resources that you can use. So a lot of us will be familiar from uh, previously working with the National Cancer Audit templates. I know that there's been work done in a lot of areas around those templates before, uh, and they're really, really helpful. And it's a good sort of off the shelf um, audit that you can um, implement. Let's just have a look at some of those documents uh, just to show you what you get if you click through and, through and encourage you to do so. So this is the data collection template uh, where you can put all the data that you're collecting as you, as Whoever is doing this audit goes through individual patient files and there's a, a, a pro form that you can use for each individual uh, patient as you go through um, and audit the activity. Um, and it's really comprehensive, looks at a lot of areas. Um, and I think the implication is that you might, PCMs may want to uh, focus on some of the individual areas that are looked at within um, the cancer audit so i think there's an opportunity to do a more focused um audit potentially if you feel that that's more relevant for your uh population uh the other tool here which is really really helpful um is the phe's fingertips data so uh, let's just have a look at what that looks like and i think you know gandhi and i could probably spend a whole session looking at this uh tool uh, i think you'll have all seen the output of this um in data provided to primary care networks, uh, but uh, the actual tool is really, really helpful as well. Um, it allows uh, really, really granular and localized uh, data to be accessed about performance in all sorts of um, areas, not just cancer areas. And it's really, really um, interesting, actually. Uh, you need to log in, which I haven't done at the moment in order to go sort of very deep into local areas. So this just shows the, um, the new cancer cases identified in England. Um, Interesting trend. One wonders if this is due to um, you know increasing quality of data really as we go through uh, those first few years. But we can really see the dip um, here. Oh gosh, I thought that dip was going to be the pandemic, um, but it's not. Uh, I don't think we're even really into the pandemic data on this graph. But anyway, really really good resource. And the quality of resources within this um, cancer uh, pack is really really good. So I'd encourage you to um, to click through and have a look as you decide how to implement. So what might you focus on? So you don't necessarily need to focus on all of the areas, um, but, uh, you know, interval between presentation and symptoms, uh, you know, routes, how did, how were they diagnosed? Was this a diagnosis made in the emergency department uh, rather than on a two-week wait referral sent from, uh, from, from primary care? You know, that's generally you know, a high rate of that activity might uh, indicate that um, the identification of cancer and uh, an early referral in primary care isn't functioning as well as it might do. Um, uh, are we following up referrals to make sure that patients have attended and uh, uh, and completed? Uh, you know, what information are we giving to patients at time of referral? There's all sorts of areas um, that might be identified as um, being good ground for improvement. And after deciding on an area or areas to focus on, um, then um, that's where your audit cycle begins, really. So I guess within the meeting that you're probably having to look at this data, you'll decide on uh, what you're going to do to improve in those areas. And, and, you know, good ways to do this are to have education events or provide resource packs to uh, to staff or patients. Uh, and there's all sorts of other things that you might do, uh, but those are fairly easy to implement examples. Um, and then finally, before your second meeting, you're probably going to want to re-audit um, in the same way you did your original audit and look for any improvements before you reflect on the data and think about how things could be improved going forward um, into uh, you know, 23, 24, because this won't end in the 22, 23 cycle. IAF and the PCN DES is going to continue forwards. Uh, this piece here is just providing a bit of, bit of narrative, actually just highlighting that um, early cancer diagnosis is lower in populations that are disadvantaged and uh, the document suggests that primary care networks uh, could consider supporting practices in disadvantaged areas. Uh, this is one of one of my bugbears with um, with some of the inequality um, things and interventions that are within the primary care network DES, in that it, it it suggests that we address inequality within primary care networks, but primary care networks are generally um, represent areas that are small that have quite common um, population 
demographics and characteristics. That's part of the idea of being able to um, tailor and, 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 and focus services and care uh, within primary care networks to the needs of particular populations. So, you know, if, if one uh, primary care network practice is in a deprived area, they're all likely to be. So uh, this isn't the way to redistribute for inequalities. And I think that needs to be done between primary care networks and between ICPs. Uh, just got that off my chest there, everybody. Uh, so let's look at service requirement two. So this is to work with system partners to improve the uptake of specific um, cancer screening um, interventions, and specifically those around cervical and bowel screening programs uh, and to do something to follow up non-responders you know that's specifically uh, re uh, required so they suggest an approach here in the uh, in the toolkit which does sound fairly uh, logical really so they suggest that we uh, review local data and they're highlighting that phe fingertips data is the place where you can get localized data about screening uptake for these two areas so definitely dive in and have a look at have a look at uh, that and that data should be quite easily available for your area um identify the programs or groups with low uptake um uh, and the groups with low participation so this is where looking at the, the demographics of those people uh, you know not coming forwards uh, will be helpful um they're suggesting that actually we might use our uh, spws or other um staff to audit non-responders so uh, this might be a follow-up which I, i'm sure would also count as uh, a referral to social prescribing uh, for them to go through um, uh, perhaps a, a framework just to work out why they're not responding as well as also encouraging them and offering them another chance to engage with the uh, with the screening program and that should de demonstrate some really interesting data actually so i'd be really interested to see the outcome of that in our uh, in our area in our primary care network um, and then they're suggesting that you, you lose that that data in 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 some way to um uh to increase um contact with non-responders and again you know you might design some sort of uh intervention or specific information that your SPLWs can use to support people and encourage uptake uh there might also be uh your social link work prescribers or other staff might also be able to do events or patient education uh to support uh, this activity as well so um just highlighting uh, the linked resources here are really really good again um they provide some uh off the shelf sort of improvement packages that um staff could implement and i think some of this could be implemented potentially even directly by splw um uh teams uh, with a bit of support uh, let's just bring up uh say one example so uh this is from mcmillan um and um, highlights a, a, a program that can be implemented to improve, improve uh, screening uptake. Uh, some of the other resources um, uh, suggest that uh, uh, there might be uh, agencies or organizations that can, that can help with, um, with implementation this in your area. So link through and have a look at some of those resources. So moving on, service requirement, um, Three has two parts, A and B. A is looking at fit testing and B is looking at teledermatology. Uh, so A, this is uh, looking at improving the, um, the utilization of fit tests to support suspected colorectal cancer referrals across the network. Uh, this section just explains um, in broad terms you know, what the expected outcome is, and that is that generally we will be either uh, providing the fit test um, uh, result accompanying urgent referrals to secondary care uh, or practices will be using the fit test prior to referral to decide on you know whether referral is appropriate that's the sort of activity that they are wanting and actually what happens in your local area may be slightly different and um, uh, I think it's important to um, you know to engage with the existing pathways or if there isn't a clear pathway around uh, the use of fit tests and there isn't clear guidance for primary care network about um, what to do with those fit test results they need to work with your local uh, recipients of those referrals your local nhs trust and the ccg to make sure that that pathway and guidance is there um, assuming that there's a clear pathway there then it's just reminding us that the um, expectations uh, are those of the iaf indicator and we should be aiming for 80 plus percent of referrals to be accompanied by a fit test um, and you begin to get uh, funding released at 40 percent and it caps out at 80. 
moving on to part uh, B. I'm just scrolling through. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, so this just provides some, <laughs> sorry, viewers and listeners, um, was nearly glazing over what is quite useful um, suggestions about how you might improve the uptake of fit tests. And it's very sensibly highlighting that um, a patient, uh, there's a patient facing element of to this, um, you know, in terms of the information that they receive at the point where they're engaging with this test for suspected cancer to encourage them to actually do it and actually uh, return their result. Um, highlighting, as I was mentioning before, um, that we need to work closely with secondary care to make sure that the referral services and pathways are set up appropriately to make use of the fit tests. And then, um, and also that the forms are, are constructed um, uh, properly as well. Finally, I would just highlight that uh, this is all set up in an audit cycle, really, isn't it? But remember that the commissioners um, need to monitor this data anyway. So uh, they will be monitoring it already. They should, they ought to be able to provide you with your data from uh, previous years to allow you to uh, reflect upon because they should have a way of capturing and measuring this information. And then at the end of the year, um, you know, they will be judging your performance against the IAF indicators. So they will be doing the re audit as well. So, really, what's required of primary care networks and practices is to reflect on current practice and put in place um, some sort of improvement plan that should deliver an improvement when the system re-audits your data at the end of the year, and that should be enough to get you over the line. Service Requirement 3B looks at teledermatology um, and how to embed the use of this, you know, where it's appropriate and where it's available is the caveat uh, that it gives and the suggestions for uh, implementation of this uh, are really um, around just raising awareness and promoting the use of teledermatology um, across your practices, potentially through um, training um, exercises um, or the distribution of um, you know, informational material to those clinicians who might be making these referrals. Um, I notice here that it's not suggesting within the guidance uh, that we audit this activities. I'm sure some PCNs will want to, and some local commissioners might expect this, but it's not something that's mentioned within this guidance and uh, just highlighting that unlike fit testing, this isn't linked to a specific IAF indicator or a specific line of streaming, uh, line of funding as that one is. The next service requirement is service requirement four. Um, this one is looking at increasing the proactive and opportunistic assessment for potential prostate cancer. Um, it specifically suggests that PCNs need to work with the Cancer Alliance. So very important to get them on board at an early stage and get them along to um, initial meetings. Uh, and it suggests that they should be able to provide um, good data for discussion at the meetings to help identify um, populations that might uh, be underrepresented in screening or overrepresented in the um, presentation of prostate cancer. And it actually already suggests that potential target cohorts of primary care networks are likely to be uh, men aged 50 or, old, or, or older. So that's pretty obvious, I guess. Um, you know, those with a family history of prostate cancer who are a little bit younger or, you know, black men um, aged over 45. And I know there's been a lot of previous um, efforts to encourage engagement on prostate cancer with that population in a lot of areas previously. Um, and uh, they make some sensible uh, delivery suggestions. And I think here what is essentially being suggested is that practices might use the data to um, identify the cohorts of men that they feel they need to focus on to um, increase screening uptake. Um, that they uh, construct some searches to identify the specific um, men within their practices that fall into these categories and that they send them awareness material and invite them uh, to engage on the issue of prostate cancer if they feel it's appropriate. Um, and uh, they link to, um, in the footer of the document, um, lots of useful links to organisations that might be able to provide off the shelf, you know, off the shelf information to support the information sent to those patients. Um, uh, these men, um, many of them will um, will then choose to consult. That's the intention, um, and have a discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, and and that discussion should should lead to an informed decision about PSA screening testing. Um, for this to work, I think that all the staff um, involved you know, need to be informed and aware of this as an intervention that's being done. So that's uh, including the receptionists will be booking the appointments, particularly including those clinicians um, who those appointments will be booked with, either in specific clinics or in their general 
clinics, it's just highlighting that those needn't be GPs. They might be other members of staff and they mention uh, nurse uh, prescribers, nurse practitioners and uh, practice nurses in particular within the document. He might be having those conversations uh, with men. Um, just a bit about funding. So obviously there's no specific funding stream uh, available for this. I just noticed that in terms of the age groups of the people involved, there's a lot of overlap with uh, potentially NHS health checks, the invitations for which are um, incentivized and funded. So there might be something that people can do smartly to link this activity with those NHS health checks, potentially. Uh, service requirement five is the, the last of the five service requirements. Um, and this um, is a requirement to review the use of non-specific symptom pathways or uh, cancer of unknown origin uh, pathways. Um, and uh, uh, and and encourage the use of those um, pathways. So um, there's actually quite a, a small minimum ask here, I think, uh, in my interpretation. Uh, and they're suggesting that the primary care network might work with partners to just raise awareness of these pathways and encourage the use of these pathways through putting on training for members of staff or distributing uh, information or educational material about the utilization of these uh, these pathways. I think that, that would be a minimum, um, but I'm just noticing that it, um, that it's not specifically suggesting that this is audited within the guidance. Some PCNs may choose to audit it and it would lend itself well to that, but um, it's not suggested as a specific action within the guidance, which I think is, is helpful for us actually. Um, and then finally, the rest of the document um, provides um, very helpful links to organizations, online tools and other supporting um, training or patient information. And it's well worth a look at all of these resources, perhaps as you've got your team together uh, that's going to be delivering uh, this work, uh, they can get a little bit more deeper into the resources. So um, all in all, uh, the ASPCNs and practices around early cancer diagnosis is quite large, uh, but this early cancer diagnosis support back, I think can be really helpful for providing a framework of how to implement it uh, and link into useful resources and it should help you be realistic about what's needed and you know some of the areas uh, the guidance isn't su suggesting we need to audit you know not all of those points which I think was quite um, helpful actually uh, to see that within the toolkit. So hopefully this video was helpful. Uh, please do share, please do comment, please do subscribe to the EGP Learning channel and look out for more content in the future and good luck as you implement your early cancer diagnosis plans within your primary care networks and practices. Thank you.